Hello and welcome to another transfer Q and A. A bit of a different one this time because we're actually pre-recording this uh, the day before. So if anything breaks, I was just saying this to Chris Dan. If anything breaks overnight that we're not able to cover in this show, we are sorry. But we are going to chat about Sancho. We are going to chat about left back options, and we are going to chat about what United should be in the market for before that window closes on October the fifth. And I've sort of just given away who's on the show. You can see him anyway. Uh, Christian Hennage, Hennage is with me. Uh, Christian, how are you doing? I'm not bad, thanks. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. I mean, we had a chat before. Um, obviously, you, you, you're a football writer. Uh, I think people out there know the front, the front three podcasts that you do. I'm a huge fan of your work on there. Um, yeah. And you were telling me because, because for some reason, it's not been popping up on my Spotify. But, but the boys are back in town. So yeah, we are. We, um, we had something of a hiatus, and then realised we couldn't spend that much time apart. So we decided uh, over a WhatsApp group chat, which is how so many of these things happen, that we get back together and, and record some episodes, and we're kind of loving it. Actually, it's really nice to be back. Oh, wicked. And obviously speaking over over this time as well, there's a lot to chat about with the transfer news, transfer rumours as well. I always love jumping into a bit of gossip too. So um and and and, and as, it, as 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 you can see, as I'm a United fan, we're a United fan channel, we have about 150 names linked to us every summer, every window. So yeah, I think this show could be an interesting one to be honest. But the but the main name is Jaden Sancho, Kristen. Um I have a habit of, of, of asking really centred questions around Jaden Sancho. I don't feel like I need to now because we know there's interest. We know personal terms have, have, have been agreed and we know what United need to do. So I suppose I'll, I'll jump straight in on this one and just sort of say, where, where do you think United are at, are at with it? Um, and, and where do we need to go next with this deal? Yeah, it's funny when people say kind of where that, I, I think there's an inherent difficulty in reporting transfers because it's a little bit like being a waiter at a restaurant that you can leave the table with all the instructions and the information. And by the time you get to the kitchen, it may have changed the conversation that they're having at the table. So I, I don't envy the colleagues of mine that have to report on transfers. I, I think your characterization is accurate, though. I think we've seen reports that personal terms have been agreed. So now it's down to that fee and a case of will Dortmund take some kind of structured deal. I think realistically from everything that I've read from, from Michael Zork is it has to be this figure that, 100 plus million euros we talk about that's the figure how they get there i think will probably be where the negotiation comes in and it's ultimately on ed woodward i think to decide whether he sees a value in Jaden sancho at that figure which is a big question and a big decision for him to make let's talk about that deal structure then just quickly i mean i don't want to go on about it too much but it is just something that i think i think united fans need to understand and people who don't have an idea of how football economics work need to sort of understand a little bit um what dortmund aren't asking for here if i'm right please correct me if i'm wrong what they're not asking for here is 120 million euros in cash on the table for Jaden sancho what they're asking for is they want to find a way to get to that fee with realistic um, expectations and realistic add-ons. Would that be right? So for instance, what what they wouldn't just 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 say for this, for instance, and, and this wouldn't be part of it, but I'm just saying saying it as so we can get a level of understanding. What Dorman wouldn't say yes to is 10 million if Jaden Sancho makes a hundred appearances for United in a season. Because that's not realistic. It's not going to happen. And there's no way something like that can be chucked into this 120 million euro deal. So in terms of how to get there, are we looking at an upfront fee? You know, and then what could those add-ons add-ons be in your experience? Yeah, I, I I did chuckle when you talked about straight cash because it made me think of them literally going to the bank and, yeah. and drawing it out with the teller. But I, I think you're right. It, it'll be clauses ultimately. And, and it's very much, I think, in, in Dortmund's interest to make sure that those clauses feel attainable. So qualification for the Champions League is one. There is, I think, appearance-related ones. Again, this is where, <laughs> to be very honest and say, football manager floods into my head and I think of all the clauses that you can put in deals there, which, I, as I understand it, is fairly accurate. You can have anything from a sell-on percentage to a profit percentage attached to these kind of deals, appearances, uh, goals and assists, this kind of thing. In some instances, it's contingencies for the buying club in terms of you know, we want a minimum of X amount of goals or X amount of assists, and then we will pay you this this sum. In other instances, it's for the buying club, uh, the selling club, excuse me, in terms of if they reach the Champions League, we want a bonus. I believe there was some bonuses attached to Bayern Munich's Champions League win uh, and, and Filippo Coutinho. So that is what makes these deals complex, I think, and, and draws them out. 
um, because you really do need to be very specific because there are legal documents attached and all of this kind of stuff. I'm sure your, your listeners know all about that kind of thing. But it, it's what makes it such a drawn out process. And ultimately, where the best deal makers in our industry, in our game, earn their money is, is through making sure that they have really gone back to the table as many times as possible and negotiated the best deal for their club. Yeah, a hundred percent, and and that's that's why Mar Marcel Zork has come out and said what he said because he wants to do that, right? He wants to get the best deal for the club who are setting a a very good player, a a world class player, and an incredible talent who's who's who, of course, many people say is is a generational talent. So, aside from talking about the transfer, Kristen, let's get let's get a bit ahead of ourselves for United fans. Um, and actually, you know, you're you're a, you're a podcaster, you're a football writer, as you say, you you know, you don't really dabble that much in, into transfers. Um, you're very knowledgeable about footballers, football players, and and football in general. So let's talk about Jaden Sancho, and let's be really blunt with the first question: Is he? A 120 million euro player yeah that wow that you i give you credit you've asked me a straight question there um and i'm going to try and give you a straight answer i i think that's what makes it difficult right now is the market is is in a very complex state because the coronavirus has obviously impacted finances across football across the world and at the same time i think we've seen some deals like the neymar deal the mbappe deal that really kind of just through the whole sort of balance of, of everything out of the window because instantly you thought, well, if Mbappe is this generational talent and he's worth upwards of 200 million, then if Jaden Sancho is a similar kind of player, then there should be no issue here. So I can understand why Borussia Dortmund got to the figure that they did. As I said before there, the coronavirus has clearly impacted things. We saw stories about Manchester United taking loans out just to try and soften that blow a little bit. So I can understand at the same time, to sound diplomatic, why Ed Woodward is coming to the table and saying, we can't reach that fee right now. The question you have to ask yourself, and this was something I thought when, when Aaron Wan-Bissaka came to the club from Crystal Palace is, could you wait another 12 months, realistically? Would you be willing to take that risk of thinking, if we wait 12 months and then say a Real Madrid comes in, he has another fantastic season in the Bundesliga, would you feel comfortable going up against Real Madrid? With Wan-Bissaka, I felt, Man United could have waited 12 months because I thought, you know what, they've got fullback options and I don't think the price for him is going to astronomically shoot up because that's just the market for fullbacks. I don't know if the market for Sancho in terms of his price will jump up astronomically. That's the other thing. I it, Some of this is socioeconomic factors and trying to predict just the market in general, which is very difficult and there are much smarter people than me that do that. I don't know if it will jump drastically. If I had to make the decision, I think I'd buy him, if I'm honest. I really do. I think he is that kind of player that will stay with a club like Manchester United for upwards of five, six years. I think if you really wanted to, you could make him a 10-year player at Manchester United. He is that good. And we saw that when he was at Manchester City and there you said he really was someone that stood out instantly. I've seen a lot of flat track bullies at youth level, but players like Sancho, I look at Greenwood as well, players that just made it look so effortless and so smooth. Those are the kind of players you think, yeah, this one can step up into the first team and do it. And many years ago, I had a conversation with Paul McGuinness, who worked with Marcus Rashford. And, and I asked him kind of, how do you isolate a player with talent in a group so big like that? And he said something that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, they have to look like a professional footballer, even at that age. And that was something that he said was true with, with Marcus Rashford. And I look at someone like Greenwood, I look at Sancho, and I think, yeah, they look like pro players already. They look like players that could be in a first team and just wouldn't look out of place from just a, I guess the way they carry themselves as much as what they do with the ball at their feet. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think what you're saying there about leaving it another year, I think the worry you have with leaving it another year is, is not even just Madrid. It's, it's a side like Liverpool. It's, it's, it's even if, if, you know, and I don't think this would happen, but say for instance, Pep goes next summer for whatever reason, another manager comes in and he's like, well, actually I want Jadon Sancho. Then there's not really any sort of reason why he wouldn't, go back to City it's going to be financially good for him City are in a great place and you worry that if United don't sign Sancho now and when we can get him will United really take that step forward to be contenders for him so to speak next year and I think that's part of our problem as well with one in a, a defensive midfielder I, I, I don't think we could go into the market and get a world-class defen defensive midfielder this year because they're wrapped up at, at clubs who are who are far more successful right now on the, the Manchester United on the pitch so I think you know we, we've got to wrap up transfers when we can wrap up transfers and if anything we've got 
as speaking as a fan, I just feel like we've got a clear punt at Jaden Sancho this summer. And if we don't sign him, then we're, you know, we're putting ourselves into a, into a bidding war, into into even making Sancho unhappy. If we've gone as far as agreeing personal terms with him and he's, he's, he's happy to come to the club, you're sort of letting him down if you don't make it happen. So would really he want to go through that all again next season? It's it's a very, it's a weird conundrum, isn't it, Kristen? There's, there's loads, there's economics, there's a player, there's other clubs, there's your league positioning, the manager of a football, like loads could change in the next 12 months, which is why it really needs to get wrapped up now. Yeah, and and the thing as well, you know, that I guess we have to remember is the the financial fair play element here. That the yeah. rules in England are going to be relaxed. So I think we've seen Manchester City look at that when there was even just the faintest talk of them potentially doing a deal for Lionel Messi. So if we we look at Manchester United's situation, I think you're you're right. There's a need for a defensive midfielder, absolutely. But is that player available in the market? And I guess that kind of goes back to to what we talked about with Aaron Wan-Bissaka about. It's so much about timing, I think, in the transfer market as anything. It's it's about knowing when is the right moment to strike for something, and and I think it's a fair it's a fair assessment that in twelve months, Jaden Sancho could have a lot more options than Manchester United, and and that's where, as, as difficult as it might be, as wonderful a club as as I'm sure you could tell me Manchester United is, you need a little bit of perspective of will there be any part of him that might feel slighted if Manchester United don't go the full hog this this summer and wait 12 months and then come back with what essentially will be the same kind of deal on the table in terms of it'll have to be that 120 million because I don't think Dortmund are suddenly going to drop their price next year. I don't understand or I can't see the logic as to why they would. That's the thing. He, to his credit, and I think a lot of players deserve credit when they do this, he hasn't kicked up a fuss. He's been incredibly professional. He's been, I would say, just his regular self has looked very good for Dortmund in pre-season. So I think in terms of trying to unsettle him or any of the things that I've seen suggested might try and happen, I don't think that happens either. I, I hate to say, but I think Ed Woodward's got to go there with his checkbook and he's got to write that check if he wants Jaden Sancho. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. The one thing that I would say that's, that's slightly confusing me, and I don't know if you can hit on this, Christian, I don't know if there's something that you might know about it, is by the looks of it, the majority of players from the international break have gone back to training today. So this we're recording this on Friday, so yesterday. They went back to training yesterday. And we've seen Dortmund post pictures of those players who are on international break on Twitter. And again, this is just, obviously, it's, it's mere conspiracy, but also mere, it does make you wonder what's going on. There's absolutely nothing of, of Sancho being there. Now, he might have been given extra leave, maybe. But let's face it, I, I don't see any reason why he he would have been given extra leave if if all the other players are there. So I think it's, it is it is realistic to say that something's going on right now, isn't it? It doesn't mean that a deal's done. It doesn't mean that they're even agreeing on anything at the moment. But something's going on because it would make sense for, for Sancho to be sitting out, especially when Dortmund have got a game on Monday and you've got a player there who's played the whole pre-season and he's still not back into training ahead of that game. Um, also, uh, Duncan Castles has, has, has just put out on, on his transfer podcast. Um, again, it's not really new news, but he says that there is a confidence at United that they will get the Sancho deal done. Um, We've spoken a bit about him, what he can bring, him being a general generation here for a long time. Is this something then that, that you mentioned a minute ago you expect to see done? Is is this a transfer you expect to go through? And if it does go through, is it the the biggest? I mean, in fee it would be, but in terms of, of investments, would it be the most shrewd, the, the, the potentially the best signing of the summer? Um, I think there's a lot to unpack there. I think the best signing of the summer, I, I, I feel like that's too difficult to say, if I'm honest. In terms of confidence, what has been interesting to me is how regularly it seems like Manchester United have briefed the press about these kind of deals in terms of putting a narrative out there, in terms of, I think some of that is done to exert a pressure on the club that they're trying to buy from, that there is a sense of inevitability to it all. That, that's just my opinion. And I preface all of this with this is just my opinion. There's no, there's no inside track from me personally. I think when you talk about him not being in the training pictures that goes back to what I said about perspective where yeah if I'm a Manchester United fan I'm looking at that and saying Sancho's not in the training pictures he's coming to Manchester United clearly he's on a plane he's something they're keeping him out they don't want him injured <laughs> everyone's 100%. looking at their flight tracker website trying to see where he is yeah exactly someone's putting him in their ultimate team whatever <laughs> if I'm a if I'm a Dortmund fan same person but in a Dortmund shirt and all that stuff I'm saying you know what fair play the club realises there's a lot of pressure on Jaden Sancho. He's just come back from a pretty arduous session with England. 
keep him away from things, let him rest up. And on Monday, we'll go and we'll have a great game. So I think it, it's so much about perspective that, you know, this is where I'm always kind of curious to talk to players about as well, though, Kristen, what was like, happening. What interests me with this this deal now, though, is that as soon as there is any leaks in the press, right, when this, when this all kicks off at the start of the window, Dortmund was straight out again. They were straight out and they were saying something or they were doing something that would sort of, you would know it would be them like basically turning around and going, yeah, this this isn't happening or no, we've not heard anything. This is basic, to, to be frank, bullshit. Um, however, now there's not that and, and there's nothing coming out from Dortmund. And you're sort of waiting for Dortmund to come out and go, Sancho's really happy. He's going to stay. He's not pushing to move. Um, basically, United pay the money or, or bug off and stop releasing stuff. But there's absolutely nothing happening. So it does sort of mm. feel like that the... The, the tide slightly turned a little bit. Again, maybe me being an optimistic fan or not, but just seeing the way that this transfer has panned out from the very first moment that the window opened, there's, there's, it's, it's very different now. It, it, feels like, it feels like both clubs might have told each other, or, or to, to, so to speak, shut up. In, let, let's do this behind closed doors. Let's, let's not go out loud with it. Um, which is intriguing. I was sort of, yeah, like you said, you really want to sit down with a player and ask these questions. I sort of want to sit down with a CEO. Like, how does this work? How do you play chess? Like, how does that happen? Yeah, I think that there's a need for discretion, I think, and a bit of, of subtlety with this. Uh, where I actually give Dortmund and, and Zork credit is that he's kind of been quite clear in it that, look, right. either they pay this much, they set a deadline. So he has said that he will be with them next season. I think outlining very clear boundaries like that has made it a lot easier for Dortmund to sit in the position they're in, whereby if Manchester United really want this player, they now have to go and set that because Dortmund, at least publicly, haven't led them on some merry dance. And I think if I was sitting at it from a Dortmund perspective, I would almost look at it from the the Bruno Fernandes situation where there was talk, there was talk, and then it, it just took a few months, but the same outcome came. And the benefit is that Sporting got in for a few months more. So I think it's difficult for Ed Woodward because he clearly wants the best for the club. I just, I'm not sure if he's the best person to be in charge of sporting matters. It reminds me a little bit of Florentino Perez with, with Real Madrid. <laughs> Business and sport are two very different beasts to try and negotiate with. And I think as much as he might think that there's a strength in holding out, I think if you inevitably cave, there will be some kind of repercussion to your reputation. And I think that kind of news travels and, and what have you. And people are, even just from, from my experience, constantly talking. Ru rumours about people, about how they operate. You see it with places like The Athletic. They have these amazing 4,000 word stories that give you the inner workings. And, and people like Miguel Delaney, who yeah. you know are, are WhatsApping people all the time there are talks constantly about these kind of people. So I just think for, for Ed Woodward, if he knows himself that Sancho is an inevitability at Manchester United, at this point, is there any real value in drawing it out? Because are you going to save, what, 5, 10 million euros, 20 million? I don't think you're going to get him for less than 100 anyway, personally. I, don't, I just don't see how that happens because of how he's performed, his potential, what he represents for England and all of that combined. So to me, it seems a fairly cut and dry case, but at the same time, I'm not <laughs> in charge of a football club. My, my uh, extent of experience with that ends at football manager, but yeah, I often right. run a profit. I must stress. Often oh, that's, but, I mean, it, yeah. as long as you run a profit, you could, you could literally take over Ed Woodward's <laughs> job. I think that's what's important right now at United, to be honest, bloody ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, no, I think you're completely spot on. So, so on that, let, let's end on the, on the Sancho night. Would he be a red? Do you expect to see that this summer? No, I don't think Ooh, it happens. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, that is interesting. I mean, I'm again, I said this the other day, I'm still 60-40 on the fence because when money's involved, you just never know with United. You you just never know now, and there is no guarantee of it. I think, I think the deal in some ways is so straightforward that it's too good to be true in terms of that we've just got to pay a fee and we get the player now. And I think that just sounds too simple. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think the last thing I would say is, to me, it will depend on how they interpret the Bruno Fernandes situation at Manchester United. Do they look at that as, you know what, we've got the player, we still you know, achieve what we wanted to achieve in the Premier League. He, he came in, was fantastic, everybody wins. If they look at that patience, those few months, as 
there was no negative consequences to our decision, then I don't think Sancho will happen. If they looked at it and thought, you know what, if we'd had him from the summer, imagine what we could have achieved. We might have even, dare I say, as crazy as it sounds, gone for a Premier League title shot. If that's the case, then I think they'll cave and they'll get Sancho. I think that's, that's the best way to articulate it. That's where the whole sort of split is between the board and the club and the fans, because what you've just said there is what the fans are saying. You know, could you imagine <laughs> if we had got him in the summer and it would have been literally like yeah. five million less or ten million more. It's like when that whole Fellaini saga kicked off with Moyes and Woodward in the first window. Could I have got him that. for seventeen million and ended up buying him for twenty-seven million. It's like if you've got a target, you need to back your manager and you just need to pay the mm-hmm. money that's needed and and let's move forward as a football club. Um, I, th- I think that's the problem now, like you've, you've mentioned there. There's that complete split and unfortunately a completely different mentality between board owners and manager fans, I think. And and that's 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 where it's tough with, with a football club and with us. Well, look, I've imp- appreciated that insight on Sancho and, and the words you said there. I completely understand where you're coming from. And I think that's why this, this transfer is so intriguing, because literally with the way it stands at the moment, it could literally be Sunday night announced. And or it could be Sunday night broken down, and I think that's what's really intriguing about this transfer. But moving on, because I want to, I want to pick your brains on other footballing matters. Are, are definitely at United. Um, so, for instance, we don't bring in Sancho. Um, there's still a need for United to strengthen. So you've you you watch a, a lot of football. You watch a lot of Premier League football. You would have seen United last season and gone over everything and reported on a load of stuff. Where else do you think United need to need to strengthen this summer? Well, I think we talked about a defensive midfielder. Um... I must admit, what stuck out to me when I watched Manchester United last season was there wasn't always a balance from the fullbacks in the final third. I, I feel bad criticising Aaron wan because he's very young and he only had a year at Manchester United. But when he gets into the final third, I just didn't see a consistent end product, which to me is very weird given he started as a winger at Crystal Palace. Now, you can argue about how good he was as a winger at Crystal Palace and that's fine. But I don't see how they make the next step when the fullback is not able to contribute regularly as an attacking piece. I kind of have a similar issue with with Brandon Williams in the sense that he's a right footer at left back. And I appreciate that he came through as a left back as well. But he, to me, doesn't seem comfortable kind of swinging it in with his left. He wants to always kind of shift and cut in. And I just think that kills a lot of the momentum. I know the club have been linked to Reguilion, who was at, at Sevilla last year. Obviously have Luke Shaw as well, who I think is kind of in this awkward stage of, is he good enough? Is he not good enough? But I just think a bit more balance at fullbacks would be quite beneficial in terms of making Manchester United a more efficient attacking unit. Um, I say all of that with the obvious caveat that they were fantastic to watch in the final third at points last season with Bruno Fernandes and Rashford and Martial and Greenwood. They're all kind of coming into to their own. But I just think those fullback positions as a case maybe for a centre-back as well in there just to, to give some more depth and, and more strength. But yeah, I think that's where, to me, there's just a little bit of work needs to be done in terms of the, the personnel. I, I do agree. But I also, I, I think I think what's difficult with this one is um, it's just so tough because you're looking at the two young lads there, Williams and, and Wan-Bissaka, that even though I do agree with you um, on Wan-Bissaka when going forward, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, and, and to be fair, we would all hope he's going to be twice the player he was last season because you know in in terms of it being only his second season full season of Premier League football as well you know it's it's it's, it's a, it was a lot last season on the lad's shoulder but you're right he didn't really produce much going forward maybe it didn't help with the way that the right wing was chopping change throughout the season you know obviously we had injured I, I mean we could make a million and one excuses for him but you're right there are areas that we need to improve in not just with players but also tactically I think also the big problem with United um and I don't know if you'd agree with this, it, it's that it's what we do when we've got the ball, I think, with our wing backs. Too easily, 90% mm. of the time, they play the ball to the inside centre back. So they just quickly play, play the one touch pass to Lindelof or, in Shaw's case, to, to Maguire. You know, there's no switch of play. There's no, you know, sort of ball into to the middle of the park. Um, and, and I think that's that's sort of something we missed when Shaw maybe wasn't playing towards the end of towards the end of the season because he may be out of the two wing backs was a player more more to find Fernandez than than so to speak Wan Bissaka does. So yeah, I think it would you call that a bit bit too one dimensional in some some areas of the pitch? Yeah, I, th- I think that's a, a fair way to to represent it. I think what I'd say about Wan Bissaka as well is it goes back to that chat we had about was last summer the optimal time to buy him because he had just had that one season in a team that really didn't ask its fullbacks to contribute a lot. I know Patrick Van Aanholt was very attack-minded, but that meant that 
Wan Bissaka could kind of get away with being a bit more defensively minded. Mm -hmm. And there's part of me that that wonders, and I, I'd actually be quite curious to hear your perspective as a Man United fan. Is is Wan Bissaka's future realistically more as a centre back because he's got that fantastic recovery pace. He he does time his tackles well. I mean, look, he never comes back with clean shots. I don't think that that's uh, that's going to change anytime soon. But if you can mould those defensive aspects of his game, positioning, you know, timing, understanding, all of those other cogs that maybe, say, Harry Maguire's got right now as a centre-back and things like that, could you make him a centre-back for this club in the long term? Because I just don't know if technically he's going to get to the level that he needs to to be an attacking set-piece for the club at right-back. I think it's interesting because I think we can say the same thing about Luke Shaw. Because Luke Shaw's best games last season were in a back three. And uh, and mm -hmm. that was quite evident with him. And I think there's a real lack in world football of, of left-sided centre-backs or left-footed centre-backs at the moment, and, and especially ones of real world class. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I think with Juan Bissaka, obviously, his strengths are always tackling. I think with United, mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a, a, a right-back with as good a potential, so to speak, even as good as Juan Bissaka is now in ages. And and I think you've got to go back to, to even... You know, Gary Neville set a legacy in that position, so you can't compare him to him. But in terms of quality on the pitch, Juan Bissaka is brilliant. I think you're right, though. I think we need to see him come out of his shell a bit. Is it the first season nerves? Is it he's played it safe a little bit too much? But he can be an attacking option. We saw that at Pot Palace. And as you said, we've seen it with him through the ranks of coming through their academy as he played as a winger. So um, I, I think it's interesting with Juan Bissaka. But I, I'm, I'm asking that question more about Luke Shaw at the moment. Because I think he can pass the ball. I think he can drive with a ball out of defence. And I think he's also good at recovering. I think he's he's, he's better at recovering um, a tackle. So, so to speak, if he lets a player go and get him back and, 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 and so, so to speak, taking the ball off him and, and putting in that last ditch challenge, then he's standing up to a man and stopping that player from going past him. So does that mean that he would actually sit quite nicely as a more as a centre-back, as a wing-back? I don't know. Yeah, I, th I think it, it's an interesting one because actually we see this a lot in youth football where players will be sort of repositioned. I mean, yeah, wan Bissaka started as a winger, moved back to, mm -hmm. to fullback. G Gail Clichy was the first example I can think of remembering of a player that started as a winger and then became a fullback. Um, there's, I seem to remember someone telling me that a lot of centre backs started as strikers, that kind of thing. So it wasn't Rio Ferdinand a striker. Um, when yeah, he, I feel like I you mean, said through. that. Yeah, I, I think he um, was. Yeah. So I, I actually think that there's a benefit in being quite malleable with how you view players in the first team and their positions, because actually th there is a case to be made that really positions as we understand them can be quite constricting. And it's really more about the skill set that the player has and how you utilise that in the team, as opposed to this person is definitely a centre back or this person is definitely a uh, defensive midfielder. I think it can work in a broad sort of characterization, but actually being willing to try those things, I think, can be incredibly beneficial. Going back to football manager, I was playing yesterday and I um, I bought Raul Jimenez as my uh, okay. backup striker. And he's now 33 years of age on my football manager. And he asked to retrain as a centre-back the other day. <laughs> Got to do it. Got to it do it. It happens in the world of football, eh? I can't wait to put him next to an ageing Harry Maguire. I think that's the centre-back partnership we're all waiting for. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned there a little bit about, about defenders. So um, in terms of who we're being linked with, who who improves then? We, 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 you've hit on fullbacks quite a lot there. So it's, it's an area you've looked at. Who who improves United more? Stay, sticking with Luke Shaw or going with uh, Regulon or going with Alex Tellez, I think is the other name that's been linked recently. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I do like Regulon because I think he consistently contributes in the final third. Um, and I think that will be important. I do feel a bit sorry for Luke Shaw because I think that leg break against PSV, it's just, it's not his fault. You know, it's not something that he could have helped. Um, and it really did kill his momentum a bit. And I know he's had concerns about or issues with weight and what have you. I just wonder if he's close to touching the ceiling of, of himself as a player. Whereas I feel like Reguilion has still a little bit more time to grow. He's got more opportunity agree, to develop. Yeah. But in fairness, that could be very much the grass is greener syndrome coming out in me because this is a new player as opposed to the one that's there. And I think we are guilty sometimes of that. They're thinking the new face is always going to be better than the one that we've got. So, yeah, I think if I was trying to pick, I, I don't mind Alex Tellers. I think he's a, a good footballer. Um, I just think that, for me, if I was going to pick one, Regulion makes a lot of sense because of the price point and everything that's attached to it. 
I completely agree. Yeah, the grass is greener kind of thing. I've I've had that, and it's gone over my brain a few times. It's like, why well, am I just saying Regulon because because he's younger and because I agree, yeah. I think he's got more promise. And I, I do actually think that Shaw's hit his hit his ceiling unless he's looking to redevelop his game, which is why I think you know back three if if Shaw's being mentioned is not a bad shout. Um, but oh, oh, go, go, coming away from so to speak, so to speak, players coming in. What about players going out? So I just want to chat about a couple of names which which have popped up on my timeline today. Really, um, I think it's also Duncan Castle who said this about um, Lille being interested in Diego Dal- uh, D- Diogo Dallo. Um, but United were only selling for the price that we bought in, which was around twenty two million. Chris Maldin looks like he is he is out the door. It looks like the deal with Roma is more or less there, so he will potentially be gone this this week. Is fifty million a still for you? Um, what do you what do you make on those couple of couple of players and points? Yeah, Chris Smalling, I think is the best for all parties. I think he looked so much better at Roma, so much more comfortable. Um, I think he could have done a job at Manchester. I think he still could have performed. I, I felt a little bit sorry for him. I think he was at the club at a time under David Moyes where there was a real pressure to perform and, and maintain the momentum and the legacy of Sir Alex Ferguson, but there wasn't really the quality of player there to do that. I think if I can give Sir Alex Ferguson any compliment, it's that that Premier League title was actually fantastic in terms of you look at what he got out of that squad and how quickly it then sort of went over the cliff. Um, so I think for Chris Smalling, yeah, he, he's, I think he's been a good servant to Manchester United and I think he's almost earned this move to, to Roma. Diego Dello, I feel a bit sorry for him because, it, again, it's that idea of squad planning and it felt like he was bought, didn't really get a ton of chances. I thought showed some flashes of an ability to go at players and, and dribble with it. And then wan Bissaka comes in for 50 million and you think, well, how is Dello going to get into this team? Because they just bought someone for twice the amount that is now this great new hope for them. And... It just means that his momentum has kind of stalled a bit, which I feel sorry for him. So, yeah, I think if Manchester United can, can sell him to Lille, it makes sense again, because that's that's the other thing. I appreciate that, you know, there are clubs that like to just keep players and, and loan them out and all this kind of stuff. But there's a point where I think, you know, what, you have to kind of do best by the player. I think you have to operate in good faith. And for Delo and Smalling especially, giving them a chance to go and play football, even if you want to put uh, a buyback clause in the Delo deal with Lille, that's fine. But let them go and play football. Let them actually go and, you know, do what they've spent their entire lives training to do. I am. Um, I know, obviously, on the front three, uh, your good friends with Lawrence, Loz, is, uh, is is on there with you. So I'm sure he will like me asking this question. And I'm sure he's asked you many a times anyway. What happens with Tiago this summer? That's my final question to you, Kristen. What <laughs> happens to Tiago? And don't worry about upsetting him. He probably won't watch this. <laughs> if he's a good friend, he will. If he's reached this point, he's a bloody good friend. Yeah, he. I can tell you, he is a bloody good friend. Um, I think. I mean, these will come back to haunt me if Sancho moves and Thiago moves, but I think Thiago will stay at, at uh, Bayern Munich as well. Um, I think Swiss Ramble did a really fantastic overview of Liverpool's finances and why this situation is the way it is because of of a lot of different reasons. But um, I think as much as Thiago has kind of intimated that he was ready to leave and all that kind of stuff. Actually leaving a club like that when you've been there that long, we saw it with Messi, it's a lot more difficult than people think. It's not just a case of sending a bureau fax, which is one of the buzzwords of this summer, <laughs> and and um, and then packing up your house. I think there's a benefit for him actually in just staying that year and then having the ability to move on a free because it gives you a much wider scope of teams to go to. You can see the lay of the land a bit better because he he is a fantastic footballer. I know he has injury problems. I've talked to 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 Dave Statman Dave about this a little bit that his injury record is a concern but for me he's one of my favorite footballers to watch if I'm honest if I just throw any kind of you know objectives yeah I just love watching him play football because of how smooth he makes it look um he could so, yeah, I think, in the Champions League final like he was brilliant yeah, I, th- I think anyone that can find calm amid chaos like that is is yeah. just yeah a special player yeah so that, that reason I, I, I just think Bayern will really do as much as they can to to keep him for that final year. There's there's a benefit to them keeping him as well, and I think for that reason, unless Liverpool again, unless Liverpool can move Gini Wijnaldum, I can't see Thiago join them. I don't know where they get the money to do that. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting because if you think you're a frustrated United fan with this whole Sancho stuff going on, it, try be a Liverpool fan. Like I've Charlotte, my fiance's dad is is a is 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 a massive. I was going to say massive scouser then, but like he <laughs> isn't a scouser, but still is a massive Liverpool fan, and um and he is extremely frustrated that Liverpool aren't doing anything to build upon what happened last year. And and his 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 opinion is like most football fans, you know, you you don't settle on a good thing, you, you build again and you you go again, and that's what Sir Alex always done and that's why United were so successful that's why Liverpool were yeah. were always successful back back in the day as well you you build and build and build and you go again and he was like at the moment there's just no building and you can't you can't just sit back because other teams around you will continue and and he just feels there's a little so to speak stutter and he's also worried about the fact that Klopp has clearly outlined a couple of targets for the board and they've just not 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 acted on it on a manager who clearly right now should have the maximum trust of any manager in world football so I think that's a, that's also a very interesting point. Yeah, I, I do feel sorry for Liverpool in the sense that you would want to... I feel sorry for them. You're on a Man United show. We're <laughs> bloody so happy. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot my audience. They've painted themselves <laughs> into this corner. Um, yes, no, yes. I, Down with I, Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, Christian's words, successful. not mine. <laughs> yeah. They weren't so blooming successful. They could have bought some players. But no, I, I think <laughs> if I'm trying to find a positive... From a, from a Liverpool perspective, they do have a core of good young players that could potentially yeah. come in here. Yeah. Curtis Jones, I know Rian Bruce is potentially going to go. That's a little bit in, in, in flux at the minute. But Nico Williams has come in. I, I think Klopp said very early doors, and I was just looking up for a piece I was going to write this week, that for him it is very important to give youth an opportunity. And you can't do that if you keep clogging the first team with players. There's a point where you actually, actually have to put these guys in and give them an opportunity. So yeah. We saw it last year. Curtis Jones had a pretty memorable moment against Everton. Maybe this is the year where more of those players get that opportunity and they break in and, and that kind of thing. I know that you can probably relate to that a little bit as a Manchester United yeah. fan, that, that that pipeline of young players, it is always just a great feeling to have. I oh, I, I don't really care which club you support. To, to see someone that's been on that journey and, and found success at your club, it's yeah, it's a wonderful moment. And whatever way you want to look at it, it's going to be a very odd season again with a jam-packed, schedule of fixtures and you're going to need to let the young players step in at some point I, mean, I don't know if you saw the young United lads uh, the other day in the EFL trade 6-0 six, six over Salford I mean, I'm not saying that's where levels are but there were some really talented young players on show there and I completely agree I think I think there needs to be more of an emphasis on, on young lads this this year and, and especially when it comes yeah. around to the uh to the uh the Carabao Cup or whatever it's called this year I don't know if it's still the Carabao Cup but still I think it's gonna be really interesting to see some of the young lads come through in the top top teams um Kristen where can people go and find you on Twitter uh, yeah, at K-H-E-N-E-A-G-E, or at Perfect. the front three. Thank you for jumping on, mate. I know you've got a busy day. We'll, we'll end it there. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> it was a transfer Q and A today without you guys asking the questions. But please feel free tweet tweet Kristen whatever you like. Tweet at all for United. Uh, get involved in the live chat and please, please, please stick a like on this video because it means it will pop up in other Reds timeline and they'll get to hear some of the wisdom that that Kristen has sort of so to speak blessed us with throughout the last half an hour. So Kristen, thanks again, mate. Hopefully we'll get you on again soon. Um, best Pleasure, of luck with the front you. three. Good to hear it's back. I'm going to go and get it up on Spotify literally now. Um, yeah. And if you're watching, make sure you subscribe to channel and we'll speak to you in a bit another transfer show coming on monday unless sancho signs by then which i'm not sure it is going to happen but we'll wait and see